welcome to our meeting. Welcome. Welcome. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and welcome. Welcome, Michael. Welcome, Marlene. Welcome, Susan. Welcome, Sean. Hi, Walid. Hi, welcome. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and welcome to our meeting. Just note that we're trans live transcribing this meeting as well. Uh, and hopefully it's going to be uh, available on YouTube later on for folks uh, to watch it later. Uh, so when you go to the, I'm going to go through that later on in the meeting, but if you go to more, you can see the live transcription as well. And if you're able to see that, let me know because it'll be helpful. So we've got about 20 folks here. I think we can get started in a couple of minutes. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. I want to make sure that we capture as many people before we get started. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. You know, we want to get to know each other. Miigwech, Tiffany, for joining us. Thank you for coming from the circle. Really appreciate it. Welcome, Marlene. Thank you for int introducing yourself in the chat. Welcome, David. Uh, thank you for joining us, the Ontario Liberal candidate. So we're going to please grab some water. We're going to be here for two hours, so grab some water, grab some snacks. You're going to be able to learn a lot with regards to what developments are happening in our neighborhood. Uh, so this is a community discussion regarding developments in our neighborhoods in Toronto Centre. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got almost 30 folks, so I'm just going to start us off. Just a quick note that this event will be recorded uh, live, also live streamed on YouTube and translated. And also, we want to thank our general support, support that we've got from our partners, Building Roots, the Regional Park Neighborhood Association, Regional Park Neighborhood uh, Associated Community Benefits Coalition, the Moss Park Community Benefits Coalition, Neighborhood Paz TO, Parkdale People's Economy, and Toronto Community Benefits Network. Thank you so much. Uh, for being partners, making this possible. The knowledge that will be transferred to residents today is crucial. It's gonna be crucial in understanding uh, developments that are happening in our neighborhoods. Uh, so thank you so much. And we've got over 31 people here today. So I'm just gonna keep on moving. I know a lot more people are gonna join us later. A call is to basically have a community conversation focused on community-led efforts to create investments through community benefit tools and community wealth build strategies. But we're gonna have a deep understanding of developments happening in our community, right? We wanna understand community decision-making, community government spaces. And I just wanna remind everyone, we also have a community agreement that this space is dedicated to creating an equitable, diverse and inclusive environment for all members of this call. So our meetings will intentionally build accessible and welcoming spaces for people of all races genders, classes, abilities, ages, cultures, religions, and sexualities. So this is a safe space to speak. Uh, so please do share your thoughts. Uh, so welcome, welcome mm. to our discussion. I'm going to now welcome our amazing presentations coming from our first uh, presenter. So uh, first presenter is Miro. Uh, and Miro works with Parkdale People's Economy. So welcome Miro. Um, and our next speaker is going to be Kumsa Baker. Mr. Baker is uh, the director of campaigns at the Toronto Community Benefits Network, uh, which is a 120 member growing coalition of community organizations. So welcome Kumsa. He's going to provide some insight uh, with regards to the Ontario line, which is coming up. We're going to also have uh, Gagan, uh, who's also the Toronto Community Benefits Network, and he's the community benefits research researcher uh, Gagan's expertise includes research and policy work focusing on sports, anti-racism, equity, diversity, and inclusion. He's going to share some amazing research uh, with all of us tonight. Uh, so Miro is going to start us off. So welcome, Miro. Um, and I don't know if you will have some opening remarks for us, but please do share, Miro. Hi. I, um, yeah, it's great to be here. This is like one of my first um time speaking to people as the community benefits organizer for Parkdale People's Economy. So um, I'm a bit nervous, but I did um yeah, it's I just want to acknowledge the Zoom trolling because it did happen. 
Um, and I want to say that um, I'm glad we're continuing on. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Um, so first I want to talk about Parkdale. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So Parkdale is composed of 46% of recent immigrants who live in poverty, 37% are female lone parents who live in poverty, 33% are racialized people who live in poverty, and 30% of people are people with disabilities who live in poverty. Um, and if you, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So 90% um, of people in Parkdale are renters, or specifically South Parkdale are renters. Um, and there's a population of 21,251 with 42.8% as lone parent families, 48.9% as seniors living alone, 34.1% as low income, and 32.1% as recent immigrants. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just a bit about like the history of Parkdale. So originally there's the construction of the Gardner Expressway um, in the 1950s to 1960s. Parkdale was actually composed, it was kind of a vacation spot for a lot of wealthy folks um, and people lived here. That's why there's many Victorian mansions that are within the streets of Parkdale. Um, next slide. And then there was the rise of apartment buildings, infamously Jameson Avenue, which is directly connected to the Gardner Expressway, um, is composed of these kind of mid-rise, or a little bigger than mid-rise um, apartment buildings, which are now being overtaken by property managers or property uh, companies like Achilles, uh, Metcap, um, DMS properties, et cetera. Keep going, please. And then there was the deinstitutionalization of psychiatric institutions in the 1970s. So there is a large population of folks who um, have substance use and mental health issues in the Parkdalian uh, population. Next slide, please. And then we also have a lot of rooming houses um, in Parkdale itself. And so there are many of these Victorian mansions have been converted into dwelling rooms um, that people reside in. Sadly, they're going away at a super fast rate as a result of the uh, large scale developments that are happening. We've had such an influx in development applications over even the co course of the past two years, which I'll get into further. Um, next slide, please. All right. And now we have the rise of gentrification. So Parkdale has um, Vegandale that's on Queen Street West. Uh, there's more and more. Ugh. It's just interesting because none of these places are actually innovative, even though that's the whole thing with capitalism. Their claim is to innovation, but they all look like um, one another and do the same things. Next slide, please. So Parkdale People's Economy specifically is a partner, is a, basically a network of 30 um, agencies, organizations, and we work towards addressing displacement, gentrification, especially have a strong focus on the way of developments happening in Parkdale. Um, as I said, there is a, a huge 90% of South Parkdale are renters, and we are being very heavily impacted by the rise of developments happening. Um, there have been many stores, places, things um, that have been taken away from much of the community. And in the name of like, there's so many chicken stops, chicken shops. Um, in Parkdale that are coming about and we don't need anymore. Um, there's also a huge diaspora community here. Uh, the Tibetan population is massive here. Um, people refer to Parkdale as Little Tibet. And it's because it's historically been affordable rent, but that's slowly going away. Um, and then there's also the Neighborhood Land Trust, which I am not part of, but we do work closely together. So we essentially, the Neighborhood Land Trust focuses on um, centering community stewardship, but 
in terms of like housing justice, we basically have methods to respond to the financialization of housing. And I think Parkdale is really good about this, about organizing tenants on the ground who are working class. Parkdale People's Economy doesn't necessarily directly or organize. Um, organizations like Parkdale Organize or um, Parkdale Community Legal Services is really great at organizing tenants to conduct rent strikes um, and work against these rent evictions that are hugely happening in Parkdale. So it's really incredible. Um, the land trust, however, takes ownership of land and they have a community board that's composed of three core parts. People impacted on sites, people uh, who use their community garden, the Milky Way garden was actually the first site that the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust owned. Um, there are also people on the board who are tenants in their existing buildings, direct users of sites, people living or stewarding their site, and there's broader community members living in the neighborhood itself. In that, it's held through actual community governance boards, and the land itself becomes held in trust and is affordable permanently as a result of that. Um, the community decides how it's held in community hands, and it was originally more of a community concept, and now it's come into fruition into an actual land trust. So we it's really centers community relationships and how we are uh, and it was a huge imagination of how a land trust could work um parkdale also is the uh first place in canada to have their own community benefits framework and so we do have a uh, community benefit frameworks that lays out exactly what we want in exchange for in with developments that are happening here um, and the first community benefits framework was actually through a labor coalition of Black and Latinx folks for the Lakers Studium in Los Angeles. And so it's as a result of these movements that we have this in Parkdale. Um, and community benefits is like a response to the developments and investments that are happening in the city. And there are different sites in which we've been able to get some community benefits, which I will go into further later on. Um, so first I want to get into housing affordability. So I think for the conversation that we're having today, it might be good to have a sense of this. Um, next slide, please. So right now, um, Toronto, well, Toronto is putting into motion a new definition of housing affordability that's connected to inclusionary zoning, but right now, Toronto, or like Toronto has been looking at um, housing affordability or they define affordability by 100% average market rent. So if you're paying 100% average market rent, then that was deemed affordable, which is kind of wild. Um, so for a bachelor, it was 1,225 for one bedroom, 1,446, a two bedroom, 1,703 and a three bedroom, 1,961. And um, those, the red shows the 80%. So 80% of average market rent would be those numbers below. Um, next slide, please. So the proposed definition, which is the one that is being put, um, that council had actually passed in November of 2021 is 30% of your income. So this is, uh, like for a one person household earning at or below 50th percentile income, which is $32,232, their rent would be $812. And so, um, and then it goes, the rest of the incomes are for 60th percentile before a one person household earning at or below 60th percent income, which is $43,244, it's $1,090 and so forth. And so there is like a substantial decrease in this model of income um, rent geared to income, RGI is what people refer to it as. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, this is RGI. Um, and so the this is the amount of money that the, these households, so it would be one person household, two person or three person and the minimum wage. And then we have the amount that they would make. So for one person, it would be 26,570. So their rent geared to income would be 664 and then um, so forth. And so you can see there's like a substantial decrease in this number that's being proposed. Um, next slide. And these are shelter allowance rates for OW and ODSP. As you can see, they're very, very, low, like you cannot live on this uh, with this amount of money and get housing in Toronto. And so that's something that's completely un not sustainable. Um, next slide, please. So this is essentially 
laying out all the amounts that you would be paying. Um, and it looked like the income to, uh, one is what how we can fill out the gap, which is the model that um, the city of Toronto is proposing or has passed with council in November of 2021. The issue is that it has been appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal, and so it's going to be adjudicated there. And I'll get further into what the Ontario Land Tribunal is as well. But it's essentially um, a planning court. So if people are not content with a decision made in regard to planning, they can appeal that decision to this court called Ontario Land Tribunal. It was formerly the LPAT. Um, next slide, please. So this is the new city definition. Um, essentially, you, it's uh, describing what was said before as being um, like a actually deeply affordable, like an affordable rent and actually affordable rent. And that's 30% of the before tax monthly income of renter households in the city of Toronto, which is defined um, by studio units, one person at 50th percentile income, one bedroom, one person at 60th percentile, two bedroom at people at below the 60th at or below the 60th percentile and three bedroom at three person households at or below the 60th percentile income so if you look at the right they has they had the original um, average market rent for a bachelor was 1221 but with the revised definition it would be 812 um, with one bedroom, it's 1,431. With the right revised definition, it'd be 1,090 and so on. And so this is really important because now when the city claims that they're going to build affordable homes or there is going to be um, affordable units within a development, then it's going to have to adhere to this new revised affordable rent definition um, as soon as the appeal process is with the OLT is um, figured out. So next slide, please. So the Ontario Land Tribunal, um, next slide, please. It was formerly called the LPAT, and then I think last year it was changed into the OLT. But why the OLT is super important is because uh, basically uh, as a result of the Ford government um, and the Planning Act, essentially, which is a provincial policy document, Essentially what happens is when a developer puts in an application, the city has 90 days to review that application. And if they don't review it, which they don't a lot because they don't have the time to review it within three months. Developer applications contain super dense things like architecture, like drawings. You have to do shadow studies. You have to determine if it's environmentally friendly. Like there's so many adjudications that you have to make when you're looking at these applications. And so planners are really, really, having a hard time, especially at the rate at which developers are trying to develop within Tar Parkdale. As I said, if you go into the development portal and it's honestly super complicated and not user-friendly at all, like they, it's like the city of Toronto, <laughs> I don't know, doesn't want us to look at it or try to use it because it is kind of, it's very difficult and not user-friendly. But if you do want to look at it, you can. Um, I can put a link in the chat. And so, um, there's so many applications. And so as a result, planners tend not to be able to do it within the 90 days. Before it was 90 days, it was 180 days, which is six months, but Ford changed it. So now it's 90 days. And now there was um, an affordability task force that was created by the Minister of Housing. And they're now trying to make it so that if it doesn't get reviewed, then it's just automatically approved with no checks, which is horrible. That's terrible. Like these applications need to be looked into, especially because these applications, this is where you can assess, are they going to build affordable homes? Do are, is it going to be universal accessible design within the units? Um, there's just so many things that have to be looked into within these applications. And as a result of not being able to do that, they go into the OLT, they go appeal the application decision, the developers do to the OLT. And then the OLT determines, okay, what's going to happen now, like what changes need to be made. And um, it honestly is very advantageous for the developer because it allows for quicker building versus actually having to adhere to the guidelines that the city of Toronto is wants them to do, but just doesn't have the time to do it. Um, so yeah, you can go through that development portal and see, uh, but the development portal is also very difficult, some, in some ways difficult to look at because some of the applications are redevelopments or some of them are just like, oh, I want to make my two-story house three stories, stuff like that. And then some of them are like, oh, these are 16-story 
uh, re like residential units. So it really varies, um, but that is essentially the public knowledge that we do have about developments. And I did find when I was running a workshop with Parkdale community members, they had no idea that these developments were coming up. They had no idea that the 16 story building was gonna be built. It just starts getting built all of a sudden out of nowhere. And you just see everything shifting within the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So this is when I was talking about the affordability task force. Next slide, please. This, is, this was released in February of this year and someone said it really well when they said this is every developer's like Christmas wish list coming true. So essentially the task force was created by nine people uh, or composed of nine people and they made 55 recommendations, but some of them include um, increasing density in neighborhoods zoned exclusively for single family homes, repeal municipal policies that focus on preserving a neighborhood's character, um, set uniform provincial standards for urban design, including building shadows and setbacks, which I think is quite silly. Like our urban spaces are different based on where we are. Um, but the huge ones are for, at least in my opinion, are limit the time spent consulting the public on housing developments, meaning that you, these developers, they already do a pretty poor job of consulting community members when they're already developing because they don't genuine, I don't necessarily believe they genuinely care about what the community thinks. It's more like a, a checkbox that they're trying to mark off. Um, but also the last one, legislate timelines for development approvals. And if the municipality misses the deadline, the project gets an automatic green light. Bad, 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 bad. So we, um, this, none of this has come into effect, but the provincial like um, elections are coming up. And so that is something to consider when doing provincial or like election organizing or um, in regard to the Ford administration. Next slide, please. Um, so I just, I'm gonna go into like some community benefits campaigns that we have worked on at PPE. Next slide, please. So this is Justice for Queens Hotel. Um, Justice for Queens Hotel is a coalition of community members and former tenants who are seeking justice for tenants, 27 tenants who were unlawfully evicted in 2015. They literally came to their uh, doors and they had notices, little paper slips that said, you have seven days notice to leave. And these are their homes. People were living here for upwards of four years. And so they didn't necessarily have places to go and stay um, afterwards. And the basically bizarre group of companies, bizarre group of companies, um, they're terrible developers. They just disposed of people's things. They threw their stuff on the side of the street. People came home and found all their things on the side of the street and had, they had nowhere to go necessarily. And um, it was incredible trauma for a lot of the tenants who were living there um, to have to go through that. So the Justice for Queens Hotel Coalition essentially wanted to seek repayment for the tenants for the uh, the for one year's rent. And they also wanted therapeutic supports offered to the tenants. So just payment for that as well. Um, so there were a lot of things that we had done as a coalition. Um, this is, there were things like we taught people how to depute. And so people would go to count like council and depute, do a deputation in regard to this. Um, we also had this memorial event um, and it was awesome because I, I personally enjoy art and we built this white house, like it's a ghost house, much like the ghost bikes of lost housing in Toronto. And so it has 27 windows for each of the tenants. Um, and yeah, PSAR is essentially trying to build an eight story luxury condo building in its place, which is disgusting considering the actual violence that took place against the people who were residing there. And so um, they, of course, uh, appeal to the OLT and here we are. And uh, you can check out the website. I feel like in terms of organizing, we made this website pretty quickly. Um, it's Google Sites. And so if you need to piece together a place, I strongly recommend this in terms of organizing, um, piece together just one place with all your resources. So we have our petitions, we have a timeline, we have images, we have um, press, like contact information in case press want to talk to us. So you can put it all in one place. And I think this external pressure was so important to at least delaying the development and bringing attention to it. Um, BSAR was fined $14,000 in um, for um, three Four count four misdemeanors of uh, unlawful evictions, um, but 
who are still seeking justice. Next slide, please. So a lot of the ways in which we have done community benefits work has been with a lot of public owned um, land. So this one, 150 Done, is a project with UHN and City of Toronto. And we, like, there was so much advocacy that went into making sure that this was supportive housing. Um, so now it's going to house around 51 seniors, women, Indigenous residents, racialized people, people with disabilities, and other people who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Um, they're going to be composed of studio apartments with a bathroom, kitchen, shared laundry, laundry, and there is a site work that's starting up. There will be an RFP, so a product of one of the neighborhood um, planning tables that Parked Up People's Economy put together is that we created a table for our social housing providers because we noticed as a result of tracking the developments that there is an influx of RFPs that are going to be put out. But social housing providers, they can or nonprofit housing providers, um, we didn't want them to necessarily compete with one another. They could join partnerships, also um, partner in terms of funding as well in securing these RFPs. And so we created this table that kind of came out of tracking and realizing this. And so uh, that we had our first meeting like yesterday, I believe, and it was really, really productive. We got a gauge of who was interested, who wanted to partner with one another. And it also meant that we were allocating time and giving updates to these nonprofits so that they had the proper amount of time to actually apply to the RFPs because it's a very um, long process. Next slide, please. Then this is another site that it was an, an, another community uh, public site that we secured supportive housing in. It was a former LCBO. It was vacant for like three years. And we noticed that this could be a site to actually have homes. And so they're currently, they haven't put out the RFP yet, but they are going to be looking for a nonprofit housing provider for the site. And the RFP will be targeted to nonprofit providers focused on housing individuals at risk or of experiencing homelessness. And, um, yeah, next slide, please. So this is a development that we flagged. So 1375 Queen Street West, um, they appealed to the OLT. They appealed because the city didn't um, assess their application within the 90 day time frame, And so there were some modifications that happened with the, uh, with the site, uh, the before and the now is before the OLT process and now what it is as a result of the OLT process. But something that we did notice is that during the community consultation, which was held in September of 2020, Scale Developments, which is a developer, said that they would apply to um, the open door housing program, which offers incentives for developers to have affordable housing within their sites. And we were so ecstatic. We were like, wow, a private developer deciding that they're going to put 20% affordable homes within their site. So um, someone flagged that the, the deadline for them to apply was in February, February 23rd or something. So I reached out to the city planner and found out that they didn't apply, even though during the OLT process, they did say they would still consider applying. Um, it was fake news. It literally was, they were just telling the community that they would consider it and they didn't. And so they're not gonna have that. So we know that this is now something we can work or organize around. You made this claim that there's going to be affordable housing on the site. Now there isn't, what's going on? And I think that this is how, you just have to constantly track like the promises that they're making as well. Um, and whether they're actually adhering to them. And um, another thing I wanted to say is that sometimes, honestly, I don't know if they enjoy this, but I'll just call the city planners and be like, what's happening on the site? What, and if, so if you go on the development application portal, each of the developments have a city planner assigned to it. So, and it has their phone number, so, and their email. So you can hit them up and you have the right as a citizen to just ask, questions about the developments. And I highly encourage you to do that because that's how you find out stuff like, oh, they didn't apply for open door housing program. Um, so definitely do that. And this is another site where we secured, um, a, well, some affordable housing. So there was a Parkdale community hub and a lot of people within Parkdale were advocating that for um, housing, like affordable housing at the hub. And so as a result of that advocacy work, um, 
counselor Gord Perks, our counselor, expropriated a dollarama that was around the site. And now there's going to be residential units there with 50% affordable homes at the unit. And so that's really exciting as um, that housing wouldn't have been there without the advocacy work being done in Parkdale. And next slide, please. Yep, I think that's it. Okay, I'm sorry I spoke fast. Thank you for listening to me. No worries. Uh, I'm actually going to stop sharing. I'm just going to say thank you, Miru. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, we just the folks are trying to get into the meeting, so they're texting me. Uh, so hopefully we'll try to get them in screened uh, into the meeting. And I just want to thank all of you uh, for listening attentively to that amazing presentation from our friends uh, at Parkdale People's Economy with regards to uh, their efforts to secure housing, not just affordable housing, deeply affordable housing, talking about the definitions, what that means, um, and, and actually challenging us on really thinking about uh, housing in a very, very constructive way when it comes to the development process. Joanne, you have a question, go ahead. Thank you, my name is Joan. Uh, good evening. It was really good to hear your presentation, Miro. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering, wanting to know, can I ask a question or do I have to post it? Go ahead, it? go ahead. Okay. Yes, a lot of information. We're going to be sharing a lot of information. So let's take questions when we Very can. Good. So, so that, it was a lot of information for me to hear and a lot of it that I've never heard before. My question is this. Um, so you talked about all of the projects that are entered into the portal. So my question is, and you, you had said that they assigned specific city planners to you know, some of the projects. My question is, is there a queue that exists uh, with, uh, within the portal so that the most, you know, the, the people that have made those applications are being looked at, those projects? Thank you. Um, is there a queue? What, can you explain what you mean by that? So I would expect that there, you might, I've never looked in that portal. So I'm, I'm expecting that if I go and I look in that portal, I could look at, I might be looking at 160 different projects happening in the city. Is there any, uh, is there any, um, like are, are pe people having those projects looked at based on when they submitted those proposals? Yeah, I don't know the way that they sort through them. I would imagine it's through submission dates, but I have no idea. That is a question for them. Um, that I could, I would, I'm actually interested in learning. Um, question, very good question. <laughs> yeah. Do you, uh, Willie, do you mind if I screen share and show the portal real quick? Go ahead, go ahead, your co-host, go ahead. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, okay, so this is the development portal. Um, I can show you, let me just show you from scratch. So this is what happens when you actually enter the site and I'm just gonna put in an address that I know. This is the one where they promised 20% um, affordable housing. So if you go to, and if I want to look, say I didn't know this address and I just wanted to vaguely look at um, developments in the area or development applications, you can see um, by zooming in and out, but it's actually like, <laughs> I don't know why it's like this. It's not good. Um, and you can go scroll around like this to look at what applications are in. And then there's also the filter, which I guess is helpful, but if you want, you can look at the development applications based on last 30 days, last 90, last 180. Um, sometimes I go to last 90 and I just like try to see if there are applications that we should be flagging um, because it's about to hit the 90 day mark for the OLT. So it's about to be appealed. Um, but if you do create a tracker, which Parkdale People's Economy does have a tracker, we do like on each of the applications, we put in the date that it was submitted and then we calculate like when the 90 day mark is gonna be. So we know that there needs to be work on that um, or just something to flag. So anyways, then we, uh, it, so if you go to the site specific, you can click it. I don't, um, I'm sure why it's not working. Let me try this again. Oh, it's because I did this. Okay, reset, search. Okay, so here you can see the, the contact, Patrick Miller, the date it was submitted, March 11th, and you can see the contact information. And then you can actually go through the application details. So this is like really interesting because when you go through this, sorry, 
it's not here, supporting documentation. So this is these are all the documents that they have um, put out. So I do have to say that I spoke to a planner like two weeks ago and they said that they're doing this new process where there's going to be a pre-application review. So because like developers just, sometimes they in intentionally submit poorly crafted applications because um, like they kind of, they don't care. They just want, it approved um, or, and the way they can get it approved is through like the OLT process. So there are, there is going to be a pre-application like um, meeting essentially between the platters, planners and the developers to make sure everything is in order before they actually submit. So hopefully that's helpful. But basically the way that I found out, the way that I like, I had heard from people that they had promised 20% but I, uh, affordable housing, but I didn't know how. So I went through the community consultation and in the presentation, they explicitly say it. And so you can go through all this. You can see if there are homes, like what homes, uh, existing homes that they're um, demolishing to build on. You could see what homes, how many, et cetera. If it's over six dwelling rooms, they have to replace it. These are all things that um, you can learn about within the supporting documentation. And um, yeah. So that's something like I definitely encourage you to at least um, try out. I saw another hand. Um, Andre? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Um, my name is Andre Bramon. I'm the uh, current president of the Corktown Residents and Business Association, as well as a publisher of a local newspaper called The Bridge. Uh, I, I I'm someone who routinely looks at the development board and, and interacts with developers in a multitude of ways. This is just a point of clarification. The, the 90 day countdown, so to speak, um, it doesn't begin until the full application is submitted, which can happen sometime after their initial submission. So it doesn't, it doesn't clock in immediately it happens when the full application is submitted and that's determined by the planners. So the difficulty in that is that you don't really know when the 90 days start, um, which is, um, well, it's a, it's a big hole in the information because mm -hmm. as you mentioned, this isn't an information war in many regards because a lot of people don't know how the process works. And yeah. those that do, um, it's still very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just wanted to point that out. Um, and the only way you can find that out is by asking the planner. Mm -hmm. And they're not always the most responsive. Interesting. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I didn't know that. Um, I thought it was just whatever's marked as date submitted on the portal. So yeah. Also uh, the planners, I, <laughs> I highly suggest just cold calling them. Um, versus emailing. <laughs> they tend to be quite responsive when I call them. So if you have a question, I would, yeah, do that. Any more questions or thoughts or insights? Yes, uh, is it possible, hi, to get a copy of this presentation, please? Yes. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna take people's email contacts, we're gonna share uh, this information, um, the slide deck, so people have this knowledge, but we're also going to have this um, uh, on YouTube. Uh, so you'll be able to catch it on YouTube in your own home while you're having some popcorn and you can learn this information because we want to make sure that it's delivered well. So thank you so much for the questions, by the way. Um, we're going to go to our next presenter. So I'm going to ask our friends from Toronto Community Benefits Network, Kumsa. Baker um, and Gagan, uh, who are going to go next. Kumsa is going to speak to the Ontario line. So I'm just going to quickly uh, share the slide deck. Give me one second, my friends. And welcome, Mr. Baker. Thank you, Walid. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to spend probably about five to 10 minutes um talking a little bit about the Ontario Line project um which is going to have a significant impact on uh, the downtown east neighborhood um and so I'll talk a little bit about the project itself as well as some of the the potential impacts that we're seeing 
Um, I myself was I'm with an organization called the Toronto Community Benefits Network. Uh, we started in the year 2014 in recognizing all of the investments in transit that were coming to our city, but also recognizing the inequities that you know transit infrastructure can have in terms of impacting some of the lo local neighborhoods. Um, you know, and, and so projects like Eglinton, Crosstown LRT, uh, the Finch West LRT, you know, uh, many of these projects going through uh, neighborhood improvement areas that have been identified by the City of Toronto um, and recognizing, you know, what is the impact of these type of, um, you know, tr large scale transit projects really transform transformational in terms of the impact to its communities, you know, we've already seen with um, you know, Eglinton Crosstown, you know, some of the devastating impact that's had to local businesses uh, along Eglinton, especially in Little Jamaica. Uh, you know, also, you know, many of the cultural impacts that it has, you know, you know, with, you know, local businesses, you know, being impacted, having to shut down, loss of revenue, um, you know, developers sort of, you know, looking at, you know, uh, some of these locations as opportunities to, to build high rise condos. And so, um, I think, you know, with this Ontario line project, I think it's really important that, you know, the focus obviously is around the Ontario line project, but also the some of the significant impacts that it's going to have on the downtown East community and, and so I wanted to sort of share a little bit about the Ontario line and, and my colleague Gagan has done some research as well in terms of what are some of the activity that we're already seeing around development in Toronto Centre. Uh, around, you know, some of these new stations um, in, in and around the neighborhoods. Um, you know, that are, you know, highly concerning, you know, and so, um, Walid, if you can pull up the slides, I quickly go through a presentation about the Ontario line, and then my colleague will kind of go into a little bit more in depth in terms of the development activity that we're seeing in the Toronto Centre and, and some of the tracking that we've done so far in terms of uh, some of the amount of proposed units that are in the pipeline, and then also, you know, what potentially that could mean for, you know, the local community. So the Ontario line is a provincial transit project, uh, which the provincial government announced in 2019. Uh, it's funded by all levels of government and in, in total it's going to cost about 10.9 billion, making it the largest transit project in history of Ontario. Uh, because the project is going through, um, I would say, many urban neighborhoods in the city of Toronto, um, it's also going to have a lot of significant impact when it comes to construction activity. Uh, and they're expecting that it's going to take anywhere between eight to 12, 12 years at different parts of this, these um, uh, new, um, uh, as part of this new project. Uh, and so specifically, there are a few uh, stations that are in the Toronto Centre area. Uh, and so you'll see closer to the middle of the screen of the map, uh, the Corktown station, uh, as well as the Moss Park station. Uh, which are um, two projects, um, you know, they're going to have a significant impact. Um, one of them, the Corktown station, is actually what the province is called a TOC or transit oriented community. And so what that means is that they're, not only are they building the new station and train, but also housing on top. Uh, and so I know, um, you know, um, folks like uh, Andre, who's part of this call, have been, you know, very involved with uh, the Corktown station and, and, you know, engaging both with the city of Toronto, as well as with the province and Metrolinx and all of the stakeholders uh, around, you know, ensuring that the community is involved in shaping what that project looks like. Uh, and very similarly in Moss Park, uh, we've been able to work closely with groups like Building Roots, uh, Neighborhoods TO and Walid, as well as um, uh, other community residents and resident leaders to start talking about some of the impacts that the Moss Park station will have uh, on the community. And as we've done that, we've also seen some of the additional impacts. And so if you go to the next slide. And so speaking a little bit about Moss Park, this is the station, pr the, uh, pr the proposal for where the station, a new station will be located uh, at the um, at the northwest corner of uh, Sherburn and Queen. Where, um, where that, uh, where Metrolinx has proposed a new station to be built. Next slide. We also know that as part of the station that's being built at Moss Park, um, there'll also be what's called a construction staging area. Uh, and so what Metrolinx has also proposed is that they're gonna have a staging area where a lot of the equipment, 
uh, uh, and uh, uh, machinery that is needed will will sort of be stored and uh, and so there's going to be a, a lot of activity around construction happening in the park and, and so what that will mean is that there's going to be significant impact to some of the green spaces in the community which is also I think uh, you know uh, 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 very limited at the current moment uh, within the Toronto Centre area where there's you know a lot of density but not a lot of park space. Uh, and so some of the conversations that we've been having as part of the Moss Park Coalition uh, is around, you know, engaging residents in terms of, you know, what are some mitigation plans? How can we ensure that, um, you know, the construction activity is not going to impact, you know, environmental concerns um, uh, around some of the construction activity and noise, uh, you know, impacts to businesses, um, but also some of the longer term impacts that, you know, I mentioned in terms of what we're seeing and other areas like Eglinton and, and Finch where, you know, new development is now starting to come and, and you know, um, proposals for, for large scale towers to be built near some of these new stations. Um, and so it's really important that the community is involved in that conversation. Next slide. And so as part of the Moss Park as well, there's the city of Toronto is also leading some of its engagement around uh, the John Innes Community Center. Uh, and so it's also a good opportunity as well um, to engage as, with the city of Toronto as it thinks about how it's planning to revitalize the John Innes Community Centre. And I know there's already been a lot of engagement uh, and more engagement to come as well around that uh, piece as well uh, in terms of some of the construction activity that may be happening with John Innes as Metrolinx is, is building. Next slide. So like I mentioned, like um, some of the things that we've been noticing already is like the concerns around the green space and some of the impacts that it'll have. Um, also some of the unclarity around some of the decisions that have been made, whether it's around City of Toronto or Metrolinx. Uh, I know one of the things that we've been pushing really hard for over the past year was to have a Moss Park uh, committee uh, with stakeholders who can really be involved in talking about some of these issues to the Moss Park neighborhood. Uh, and so Metrolinx has recently formed that um, with a co-chair from the community um, to actively engage uh, and have the community involved in some of these important discussions. Uh, we also know that there's going to be lots of density coming around uh, the neighborhood as well. Uh, and so just to the south of it, I think uh, of Moss Park, we saw that there was a development application for, uh, I think it's uh, uh, a 60 story uh, condo tower. Um, and so what is that going to mean and, and how do we make sure that we're actively involved in following some of those developments uh, to make sure that it's equitable and that, you know, some of these conversations and, and priorities around affordable housing, um, you know, park spaces, green spaces are all sort of addressed uh, and that the community is involved in that process. And, um, and can we advocate for excellent revitalized community center? So these are some of the things the Moss Park Coalition have been thinking about. Uh, around, you know, how the, the community can benefit from the investment. Next slide. Um, and so this is a, a snapshot from the, uh, the website that Miro had uh, shared and, and gone through with everyone. Uh, this is actually a snapshot around, uh, so I think it's a 500 meter radius around the Moss Park station. Wow. Uh, my colleague will go into a bit more in depth in terms of the map for the wider Toronto Centre. But this kind of gives you a sense of like, you know, when we talk about density around, uh, you know, in some of these new stations, um, where some of that activity is already starting to happen. So these, some of these are uh, smaller sort of proposals to uh, for uh, smaller projects, but we also know that uh, some of these blue dots um, uh, indicate some larger scale development uh, and developers who are purchasing up, you know, uh, parcels of land, uh, assembling land as well. We know there are a lot of retail fronts along Queen Street uh, and so a lot of this type of activity is to already starting to happen. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think like this is an important conversation. So, you know, thank you, Walid, for uh, pulling this type of conversation together. Uh, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Gagan, uh, who will share a little bit more in terms of the in-depth um, analysis that we've, we've looked at so far around development in uh, Toronto Centre. Uh, and just a reminder for, for those of you who are interested in learning more about the Ontario Line project, uh, and some of the impacts. Um, our organization, the Toronto Community Benefits Network is gonna be hosting a town hall. That's gonna be bringing groups from different parts of the Ontario line. And so I know a lot of the conversation here today is around Toronto Center, 
uh, but we're also hoping to have an Ontario line focused conversation with communities that are going to be impacted all the way from the north to the south. And so uh, really encourage you to sign up and register. I'll put the uh, event uh, link in the chat box if you want to RSV, RSVP or share it within your networks. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Gagan, are you next? Yes. I'm next. Yeah. Did you want to take questions now, Ulid, or after uh, I go? Uh, does it actually we'll stop and actually it's a good uh segue does anyone have any questions because we're going now to go into the research the really juicy stuff this is the this is the part i've been waiting for um and and thank you so much uh mr baker for providing context uh to what's going on in the ontario line and how it's affecting all these communities uh not just uh corktown moss park uh but you can uh look up north right every single community that's been affected with developments uh will, will have to address some of these challenges um but this research is pretty crucial i hope folks have an understanding of the tools that you could navigate to get it uh and uh, i'm just wondering if anyone has any questions uh with regards to the ontario line specifically in the developments and the work of the various coalitions No questions. Okay, so this is now the juicy stuff. Gagan, are you ready? Yep, I just need the uh, slides up. Okay, perfect. Here you go. Awesome, thank you. Thank you to both uh, Miru and Kumsa for excellent presentations. Um, so as Kumsa mentioned, my name is Gagan Najjar. I'm the Community Benefits Researcher at Toronto Community Benefits Network. And I was asked to essentially go over development um, applications in Toronto Center. Uh, but before doing that, I wanted to provide some background and some context. Um, I know that whenever we're having this conversation around development and around development applications, it's not necessarily the easiest of topics to understand and to process. So um, before we jump into sort of the nitty gritty and what the research revealed, I'm just going to provide some, you know, definitions and some key uh, sort of concepts before we go into that. Um, so essentially, the three most common types of applications that I came across when doing my research in Toronto Centre um, were the official plan amendment application, that's one, the second being a rezoning application, that's two, and the third being a site plan control application, that's three. So typically the OPA and the rezoning applications are gonna be your much more larger scale applications. Um, and then the site plan control applications um, is also, it's also a pretty large application as well, but it's smaller when compared to an OPA and, uh, and a rezoning typically. Um, just in way of some background definitions. So the OPA, the official plan amendment application is required for any changes to the city's official plan. Uh, which sets out policies and objectives for future land uses. So it's essentially anytime you want to make a change to the city's official plan, you have to go through the official plan amendment application. So it's probably the largest application um, and also the most costly as well. And then on the other hand, um, or rather similarly, a rezoning or a zoning bylaw amendment application um, is used when you wish to alter your property in a way that does not conform to the land use control set out by zoning bylaws. So it's sort of the next level down from an official plan amendment application, but it's also quite large in scale as well. Um, and then you have the site plan control, which is essentially, it's on a smaller scale, but it's more so with the design and technical aspects of, of proposed developments as well. Next slide, please. Okay, perfect. So this essentially is a, is a flow chart. Um, and what you see on the right side of your screen is a typical sort of process when it comes to uh, the submission of an official plan amendment application or a rezoning application. Uh, essentially at the top, um, I think Miru mentioned it earlier, but generally developers will have what's called a pre-application consultation meeting with the, with the city and with planners within the city. Um, it's known as a PAC meeting. That's where essentially they, they get the merit of their, um, of their application and whether or not it's complete and ready to proceed. Um, after the application gets submitted or after it gets um, submitted to the city, it gets circulated um, to various departments within the city. Um, and then it kind of just follows that flow chart down. Um, there's also a, a public meeting generally um, at community council that's open to the public and that happens before a council decision is made. Um, just some notes on this as well. There's a small little um, 
asterisk there that says timeline is roughly nine months from the submission of complete application. That's generally not true. It's, it's difficult for applications, especially rezoning and OPA applications that are so large in scale uh, to go through A to Z um, and be completed within nine months. It's generally over. Um, and also as well, um, we should also mention section 37 here, which is being changed to um, now be referred to as community benefits charges, but it's also another way um, throughout this process that uh, the community can get community benefits through these different developments. Next slide. Okay, so jumping into the research, um, Essentially, what I examined um, is the past 180 days of development applications in Toronto Centre. So again, we use the same website. It's the City of Toronto's Application Information Centre website. Um, and the research focused on the past 180 days. So essentially, plugging in that result, um, it turned up 89 different properties and 20 active development projects within Toronto Centre over the past 180 days. Um, however, it should also be noted that this search can be expanded further back as seen in the image below. So if you remove the 180 day filter, again, there's the 30, the 90 and the 180 days. But if you don't put any filter and you just search the entire history of Toronto Centre um, in terms of active applications, you can go as far back um, and get uh, results with uh, 588 properties with to, uh, with a total of 82 active development applications. So as you can see, it's quite large in scale. Um, my research focused specifically on the past 180 days and that turned out 20. So if we expand that outwards, you can see just how many more development applications um, there are. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of our research and results, essentially we, we consolidated all the information into a tracker, which I'll share um, in the chat uh, just after this presentation. But just uh, in terms of a breakdown, I've broken down some of the main points. So again, the research was based on uh, Toronto Centre over the past 180 days. Um, and we received uh, a search result that gave us 89 properties and 20 active development projects. So just some key uh, sort of results from that. 16 out of the 20 applications were either an OPA or a rezoning application leaving four out of the 20 as site plan approval. So again, uh, a majority of the applications were much larger in scale. Uh, another interesting note was BJL Properties Inc, which is a uh, real estate brokerage, but they also have a development arm um, in the brokerage as well. They came up three different times on three different projects as a developer and a landowner. Um, that was, yeah, Brad J. Lamb. That's the, um, that's the main honcho there. Um, and then also roughly around 12 applications, I'd say out of the 20 can be considered large scale developments. So that's my own definition of large scale. I just plugged in over anything over hundred units. Um, again, a lot of the developments, because a lot of them were submitted recently, you know, in March and, and February, they might not have up to date information in terms of their units and their stories. Um, so that number, the 12 can actually be a lot higher, but so far, based on what I found, it's 12 out of the 20 um, have over 100 units that they've identified and the heights in terms of story height uh, vary as well. You have as small as 10 stories, which, which might not even be considered small, but then you have as large as 50 to, to 60 stories as well. Um, and then only one out of the 20 active development projects mentions affordable housing units uh, through the information section on the city's AIC website. So again, um, it should be noted that when we went over that that brief website, there's a there's an information page, um, a part of each development, um, and that information is basically, or that page rather, is a paragraph. It's a snippet um, that the developer or the applicant, whoever is submitting the application to the city, um, provides an overview of their um, of their development. So it's voluntary, but only one out of the 20 projects actually mentions the affordable housing units that they're going to be um, adding in there. Um, we'll lead, uh, if you can zoom out just a little bit, I, I, I think the last bullet point is just a bit cut out for me there. Oh, sorry about that. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it now. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, then the last little point there is just... Um, we did a calculation with the total number of units that we were able to um, tabulate across the 12 applications. 
um, or rather the 20 uh, applications and the 20 developments. So in total, there was 4,316 total units. Um, and then with only 32 of those being outlined as affordable housing units. So again, disclaimer on that, um, that's just the information that was publicly available and provided upfront through the city's AIC website. Wow. Um, can that 32 units change further down the process? It possibly can, you know, developers, it may be added. It, it may be something that comes up later, you know, after community engagement um, conversation or community consultation conversation. Um, but upfront, based on the information that's publicly available, um, out of the 4,316 units that we identified, only 32 of them actually were upfront um, as being affordable housing units. So that was only one development out of the 20 that basically said, um, yes, there'll be affordable housing and there'll be 32 units. Wow, we can wow, jump wow. to the next slide. Okay, and then we just had another example. Um, this is essentially just, uh, just an example um, this wasn't a part of the 20 development applications that we looked at for Toronto Centre over the past uh, 180 days, um, but it's also particularly relevant um, for 5 Sherburne Street is, uh, that is because it's a Create TO City of Toronto property. So this was another um, development application. I believe it was about maybe a little over the 180 days, which is why it wasn't in our catchment area for our research. Um, but essentially, 4 or 5 Sherburne Street, uh, right at Sherburne and Carleton, is currently a Toronto parking lot owned by the City of Toronto. You can see that uh, in the first image on the left there. Um, and then through Create TO and the City's Housing Now initiative, there's a proposal for a 25-story mixed-use building that'll include 266 dwelling units, including 133 affordable housing units. So that's just another example. And then I thought it was interesting that it's coming through um, create TO in the city's housing now initiative um, in terms of ways to increase affordable housing. I think we have one more slide possibly. Okay, so key takeaways. So just in terms of a summary, um, or I guess a, a why it matters section, um, the first point is, again, it, there's a large volume of development applications in Toronto Centre. We focused on the past 180 days, um, but you can branch out even further than that. And the key takeaway over the past 180 days is that they are they are also uh, mainly large scale in both scope and size. So referring to the fact that they're mainly OPA and rezoning applications that we were seeing. Um, and then on the city's AIC website, again, this is the publicly available information that I was able to access. Only one out of the 20 developments provides an upfront commitment to affordable housing. So that's 32 units and that's only one development. The other developments, they might have had the units indicated without affordable housing. They might have not even indicated the total amount of units. But again, the key point there is only one out of the 20 upfront when submitting their application had that commitment to affordable housing and it was only 32 units. Um, and then three, just as a, another key takeaway, um, I, I think I prefaced this at the beginning of my, of my presentation, but uh, the development industry and planning in general is something that's it's difficult for the lay person to get their you know get their head around it there's a lot of technical knowledge there's a lot of you know difficult words and stuff so it may feel like it's an industry you know that's you know without change or so far gone you, you can't penetrate it in any way um but these are just some points right i think what's key is that organizing has to happen on on a community level um, and I think that's what's so great about the neighborhood coalitions that are here attending and, and the different coalitions that we have um, is that it's about building capacity and knowledge among these different community members, you know, neighbors, residents, um, et cetera. And again, although a lot of this information that I covered is, is public, it's inaccessible. And what I mean by that is that it's difficult to understand and navigate it. As, as Miru showed in her example, just going through the city's AIC website, it's difficult to understand it. It's difficult to, you know, navigate it um so again it, it, it is public information but it's uh, it's difficult and that's sort of a roadblock but i'll leave it at that for, for our three um key takeaways thank you for so much for like emphasizing how inaccessible and difficult to understand and navigate and, and gagan what an amazing presentation thank you so much uh i think you blew my mind away with the facts uh, and the lack of actual commitments uh, to affordable housing. And we haven't even talked about deeply affordable housing and the various definitions related to housing. 
that people need to understand, right? uh, because language and diction and, and how uh, things are communicated matter. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, there are some resources uh, and links that are going to be shared in the chat. So this is your Toronto Application Information Center that we talked about, but also the Toronto Center Development Tracker. My friends, knowledge is power. You need to know this information. You need to know what developments are happening around your neighborhood. You can be walking with your family down the street and alas, a brand new building just popped up and you are not consulted. Uh, you are not involved in the decision making. It's important for you to be involved. So please track developments in your neighborhood, get involved with the coalitions that are holding developers accountable, the uh, our, our, uh, elected officials accountable to make sure that uh, investments are not imposed in communities and, uh, and things are not just built for communities, uh, that we actually have an opportunity through that process. Uh, we're gonna talk quickly about home ownership uh, because it's an integral piece of our conversation today. Uh, it's how neighborhoods uh, actually exist. Neighborhoods are, uh, you know, not just businesses and service, uh, uh, service providers and service centers or community centers. It's also homes. And we're living through a very challenging time in our city when it comes to home ownership. It's become so far-fetched as an idea for many. And that is something that must not be the norm. Uh, home ownership is an integral way to make sure that uh, wealth is passed on from what intergenerational wealth is passed on. But most importantly, uh, homes are uh, an integral way for uh, many of us uh, to have safety and security. Uh, you know, we call it a human right for a reason. And that's because the root causes of poverty is when folks are uh, don't have access to the basics of human right, uh, such as home ownership and access to housing in particular. So some facts uh, from the revite of phases one to three, some quick learnings. Um, you know, um, there was about uh, just 17 residents that accessed home ownership. So 17 folks from the community that accessed home ownership. Majority of folks uh, moved into the community. Um, so we are trying to make sure in phases four and five that it works uh, for residents of uh, Regent Park, current residents to access home ownership. And I'm glad that Daniels actually announced at our community celebration in Regent Park, uh, just this Wednesday, that they're gonna be launching a home ownership program in the summer. So look forward to those details. Uh, we need to make sure that those opportunities exist for residents. Uh, but it's not just about home ownership, it's also about good jobs. We're gonna talk about that next, but before we do, some programs that you might be aware of and you should be familiar with is the foundation program and the boost program, uh, you know, programs that were put in place to uh, promote home ownership. And at the, the foundation program is for eligible TCHC tenants living in re certain revite communities uh, with, uh, through a down payment. So the support is a down payment assistance to up to 35% of the price of a new home. And the boost program, House eligible home purchases with a down payment by providing assistance of up to 10%. And these are the conversations we're having with other levels of governments about the level of down payment assistance. Uh, is it enough in this market? Uh, so please look out for details with regards to that. I just want to thank and acknowledge uh, that uh, we are in the midst of uh, identify key priorities, whether it's in Region Park or in Moss Park or in Corktown, because of all these developments that are happening. Uh, and it's gonna impact all our communities. So it's important for us to raise questions uh, today with regards to the developments in our communities. Uh, so I'm actually going to now take questions from, oh, hello. and we're gonna have a discussion. So I heard Michael, wanting to speak so michael do you want to start us off yeah i just wanted to know if you want like an update for me uh, go ahead update us my friend go ahead what would you like to share okay so like there's two things one is just sort of the general sort of process of working uh on uh development planning um you know planners have like urban planners people who are in the profession have strong beliefs Yes. Um, 
They spend a lot of time in school sort of being um, like exposed to a particular way of thinking. And it's, it's really hard to spend four years in school if you don't believe what you're being taught. Like people who don't believe it would have quit before four years. So it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's a, it's a system that creates people with very strong beliefs. And so um, sometimes they don't really follow why people are objecting to things. Okay. Um, and we have to be aware that, that um, you know, they honestly believe what they're saying, and that mm-hmm. makes it even harder to change their mind. It's like they're, they're not intentionally trying to do something that people don't like. They just don't understand why people might have different ideas than them. So it's like that's the environment. It's very hard to sort of get planners to change their minds. So it's important to work with as many people as possible, whether that be the developers themselves, the politicians, like really broaden the range of people. Don't expect the actual review process of the planning department to be your own only way of getting things done. Um, unfortunately, in the meeting this morning, they seem to be deferring back to the planning uh to the Toronto Planning Department to, heard that to clearly. Uh, yes. review things. So I was a little concerned about that, but we'll continue to try to work to get the things we want into that space report. Yeah. Um, um, the other thing I want to sort of update the AOCC, which is the Association of Community Centers. It's like the to get a place like the Oops. 519 in Regent Park. Yeah, um, so I guess we're going to have the request for that in the report. That doesn't seem to be in doubt. It was the whole issue of square footage and who was making those decisions that was a little bit in doubt. But the fact that there is a request for an AOCC as a community-controlled space with a board of management that is uh, like runs through a fairly good open process, um, that seems to be at least on the agenda, but I still feel like they, they have a strong likelihood of not actually implementing it. So I'd like to sort of set up an actual organizing committee of people who will continue to contact politicians, the developer, and the TCHC, and the, and the city staff about Excellent this suggestions, issue so Michael. that it actually happens. Excellent suggestions. We're, we're in the midst of an election. It's an upcoming provincial election, but there's also an upcoming municipal election. And I think making those asks uh, now are so important so that we can get commitments uh, and also like public support for those uh, measures. I, I did see uh, Marlene's hand go up. Marlene, did you want to ask a question? There's a lot of knowledge here today. So you just want to make sure people... Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine. Go ahead. Perfect. So um, I'm wondering if uh, folks would like to just share their experiences with regards to developments happening in their neighborhoods. Um, and then that will be a good segue to talk about um, how, what learnings have come uh, from various coalition work when it comes to developments and how we can organize as a community uh, to ensure that our priorities um, are not just ignored, but they're implemented. So I'm just wondering if folks could just talk about their experiences with regards to developments in the neighborhood and would like to go first. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, sort of uh, it's, all the conversation has been really, really helpful. Um, but what I've been focused on uh, lately is post-development start. Like what happens after it starts? How does it impact the community after it starts? Which also goes to the planning. And I met a lot of you at the Metrolinx conversation a couple of weeks ago. Like, how are they planning on the mitigation? How are they planning on getting the spent trucks and the dump trucks through? We're talking Metrolinx for 10 years, 10, 12, probably 15, knowing the way it works. Um, so that's an impact on the community uh, just during the construction side of things. Um, I've developed a really good relationship with the six developers in my neighborhood. We have six towers going up within a rock throwing distance of my balcony uh, and six more being planned. Um, 
today, as I looked over the balcony, the, uh, the developers at my request have been out there with shovels and street cleaners and made sure the, clean, the parks and the, the sidewalks were cleared, uh, which was great. Uh, now it's getting the city to do their part because the Toronto Hydro came in and dug up some stuff and left everything behind. So that's the balance there. So it's building those relationships to have that conversation. So a phone call or an email could be sent to, to build on to protect the neighborhood as the development happens, because once it starts, it's uh, it's pretty much all hell breaks loose. Um, going backwards to other conversations, uh, article, article um, section 35, the development commitment oh, the to the community. community article, uh, yes, that, that is being adjusted and changed right now. So that's the conversation that has to be brought up. Um, before Ford got in, I had negotiated with one of the developments to have 27 units for seniors housing, a seniors housing cooperative, sort of, so the conversation can start. Within a month, that has changed. The develop the developer stopped their stopped their uh, their proposal and resubmitted, and they didn't have to provide those 27 units. Really? They had, yeah. So all they had to do is provide a, a, a small fee to to pay for things later on. Uh, that went into the kitty at the city. So it, it's, yeah, so how do we get those things back? How do we, how do we get that negotiation started? Um, how do we look at the different levels uh, of, of housing and housing needs? Um, how do we put people in housing that need the housing? How do we support people who want to use housing as the, the Daniels project of providing a step to the next level? How do we how do we add all those into it? So so there's yeah there's lots of uh, lots of conversations to have and uh, having a calm level head uh, <laughs> on all levels is like so important. I spent so many years banging my head against the wall and don't, my desk. Well, you don't have to do that alone, Mark. You don't yeah, have I to know. Do that alone. But it's fun. it's how do we how do we just create the conversations and develop the language to to help those those ears open up. So it becomes part of the more well, accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll let somebody else talk. Now, so. Well said, Mark. Well said. Marlene, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think I, you know, I do want to say something. Um, I'm probably one of the oldest people here. And I, I think that what I've seen that's been so dismaying over the years and, and really more so in the last 20 odd years is the change in this city, I've lived in Toronto all of my life. This, this is my home and I, and I love this city. But what the builders have been doing in the last 25 years, just unstoppable, has changed the face of this city. And for those of you who haven't lived here for that length of time, what made Toronto just an amazing place to be were the pockets of like every area in Toronto was different. You, you just go through the city and there'd be these pockets of ethnicity and like was magnificent. Everywhere you went was different. Now we have this homogenous mass that our city has become. Everywhere you go, it's pretty much the same. All the wonderful places that there used to be are gone. Um, I remember being able to go from, you know, to, to go out in the evening and you'd go to little supper clubs or music events and all these music venues and art galleries and the reason people wanted to live in the city are going. Yeah. After a while, who, who, what will be the reason to live here? The musicians are gone. The artists are going. There's no place for them to live. Yeah. You know, all the creative stuff that used to make up a city mm -hmm. is disappearing and the greed is swamping us out. Yeah. And they don't care about neighborhoods. Yeah. They care about the money that they're making. Well said. And they'll do it. They'll get the job done in any way they can. Mm -hmm. It is an obscenity that they're building, say 4,000 units and 32 are affordable. Can you believe that? How does a city allow that? 
And yet, you know, Mayor Tory, you know, is patting himself on the back because he brought the UN in here and saying that we're, we're concerned about poverty and we're going to do things so differently. It, it's, it's ridiculous. And here's one more thing with the UN where there's going to be a lot of hoopla and he'll do nothing, absolutely nothing. We have to get together as groups around the city. We can only do this working together. Yeah. You know, we're doing our bit off side in Regent Park. Regent Park is just one little community. We can only do this if it's a mass. Exactly. Of, of communities to Joining together. forces with other yeah. communities. We yes. must join forces. We have to work together and tell them no. These greedy bastards move to their wealthy areas outside of Toronto. That's where they live. Or the really wealthy spots in the city. That's where they live. They don't care what's happening to our areas. This will be a place for only wealthy people, wealthy people. And they don't care about the poor. And they don't care what's happening to us unless we speak with one giant loud voice telling these people on council that no, you're not gonna do this. Tell Ford, no, you're not gonna do this. And we can't do it with all of us in our own little silos. We have to do it together with one big voice and we have to bring in the other communities around the city. It's not just in the East. It's the entire, it, it's the entire city that this is happening to. Very well said. And if you could, if you could have seen Toronto, even twenty-five years ago, you would not believe it. You wouldn't believe it. What's changed? We've lost heritage buildings and magnificent communities, and they're gone for good. For good, they're gone. Thank you so much, Marlene, for speaking from the heart, speaking the facts, and actually challenging all of us to reimagine a different possibility. You know, we don't have to be a city of just towers. We could be a city of culture, a city that actually is accessible and affordable, and not just a city for millionaires. The, you know, sunshine, I don't want... has disapp the sunshine has disappeared from Toronto. We have to we have to break through the clouds and bring that sunlight back. And, and I'm so glad that you made the distinction about the applications that are going to, to the city over 4,000. Take this in, my friends, over 4,000 applications and only 30, over 30, just over 30 are uh, units, how affordable housing units. We don't even know if they're deeply affordable, right? And, and that is preposterous, especially when you open, you know, the news and you hear all this commitment for affordable housing or home ownership. Where is the paperwork? Where is the where where are the receipts? Where are the receipts of those applications? Right. And this is why we're having this meeting is for us to distinguish the rhetoric, what you're hearing, the rhetoric and the facts. You need to know the facts because you're all community leaders. You're all residents that deeply care about this city not be, being developed to exclude some of us. Because if that happens, our community is going to change forever. Right? And we must push back against irresponsible development and the lack of accountability. And most importantly, what we heard from Miro earlier and from Gagan and Kumsa was how this information is inaccessible. We have to look to our amazing researchers who have this knowledge, who have access to these tools, who are able to pull this information for this to be part of our conversations. Wouldn't it be easier and much more transparent if everyone had access to this information easily, right? And there was actual policies that determine that they must be 
affordable housing as part of every single application. Those regulations do not exist. They don't. Um, I see Maggie's hand up, so go ahead, Maggie. Thanks, Waleed. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maggie, and I live on Girard Street uh, near Parliament Street. And um, I just wanted to share uh, that affordable housing is obviously a priority. I agree with what you just said, but my notes from earlier that I wanted to let you know are also my concerns are that um, even if things are affordable, the standard of living in terms of like, not just inside of the units, but the um, way that the streetscape is designed need to be, um, you know, regulated so that for every person that's going to live in an area, there need to be uh, facilities and amenities and um, natural like public spaces and all of the things that um, give like a certain quality of life. So that's a really big concern for me with the applications that are going in for the next phase of Regent Park and like in general for the way development is happening around the city. Um, my other main concern at the moment is just with this, that application specifically about um, the proposed, like the incentives that the city is being offered in exchange for those um, additional uh, units to be added, such as the um, like private public spaces that are inside of the towers that are not like parks, public park spaces and not really public spaces um, and some of the other things. So I'm really interested in trying to figure out how um, to promote like that idea of like- a No, no, I, I get what your point is. And okay. Maggie, there's actually hundreds of residents that have joined a Facebook group related mm -hmm. to rezoning uh, to have those conversations. And we are also having those conversations at the Community Benefits Coalition in Regent Parks. So I wanna invite you, Maggie, to join our future meetings uh, so you could inform those conversations. But I agree with you, you can't build a responsibly. You can't just build high density and not have the facilities to support the, the, the increase in density, whether it's schooling, but also community spaces and resources, right? Uh, and in the past, in phases one to three, they just built it for us and said, go ahead, go use it, right? It wasn't built for us with us co-developing and co-creating what it is, right? And I think that's the approach we're taking with, with regards to phases one, five. Now, with regards to rezoning and the whatever benefits or, or, or um, uh, pros or cons that come with rezoning, because if it's not done well, who's going to pay the price? It's the folks yeah. who are living in the community, right? The developers are going to pack up. They've sold their units. They've made their profits. And they're like, take care. You know, that's not my problem. That's a city problem now. Right. And what are the social costs that come with the responsible development? So I agree with you, Maggie. We need to be intentional about what is built in our neighborhood. It can't just be arbitrary towers built so that a few families or a few companies or a few developers, and, and we talked about some of them. Like, look at look at how many applications, like one developer. I can't even what's uh, I think we should try to make this developers famous, by the way. What's that developer's name? BC? What's the person's name? BJL. BJL. Brad, Brad J. Lamb. But I'm he, gonna he's, he's... I'm going to mention them in the news tonight when I get on CP24. Yeah. BJL. You know, let's make these developers famous for the wrong reasons. And that is the lack of commitment for affordable housing, for deeply affordable housing in our city. Right? Yes. Uh, and, and also, let's call out uh, how developments start off, right? There should be community that starts off this development process, not the developers uh, who meet behind the scenes to decide how much profit uh, they're going to take, right? And who's going to benefit from it. Uh, yes. I see Calvin next, but Maggie, I don't know if you're done. 
but you go I ahead. Just, yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure that, um, like, just to clarify, like, I think that density is helpful to the city, but I think that, like, there is a possibility for too much density. Like, mm -hmm. if the application came back and they increased, like, if they made the towers even higher and increased the number of affordable housing, I don't think that it would give a good quality of life. So, mm -hmm. I like, I think that other types of property can be like, uh, you know, targeted for density, but not in the form of towers. Um, and uh, I forget what I was going to say. Um, sorry, I totally am blanking on what I was going to say. Um, what were you just saying? Oh, oh, um, you mentioned. No, what I said was, I think your, your, your input was so thoughtful. You're right. Mm -hmm. There are concerns regarding density and you talked about the quality of life, right? And how it's impacted. And I agree with you. I think we need to make sure that the quality of life is not impacted. Marlene spoke about how our city has changed so much, right? Um, and, and that actually has an impact on the quality of life. So I agree with you, right. Maggie. You know what, if I think of what else I was going to say, I'll just drop it in the chat. So thank you so much. No, well, thank you, Maggie. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we got Calvin and then Mark, I think you, I, I don't know if you want to speak again, my friend, let me know. And then so we've got Calvin, Mark, and then Marlene um, to end us off before we do our announcements. And look, we still had our meeting, right? That we're not successful, which is awesome. Yeah, that's so right. Go, go ahead, uh, Calvin. All right. Yeah, that was the part where you said that we need to make our developers famous for the wrong reasons. I had a similar idea, especially remember in the WhatsApp group when I spoke about uh, speaking with one of the developers closely, uh, yeah. developers closely about, uh, you know, uh, um, possible volunteer opportunities. I, I hope it's not uh, off topic. I mean, I mean, volunteering with residences so they can understand how we operate and um how we necessarily operate as a community through all the issues and all that kind of stuff because it's not it's not you know to us it's not it's not a bad development i hope i have a chance to address you know our developers publicly but one of the things i wanted to say is like you can't call yourself a developer of people if you do not know how those people work you know it's like a it's like a scientist trying to say oh i'm trying to cure uh, cancer or COVID, for example, without knowing how the uh, bacteria or the science behind the disease. You need to see how it operates. You need to know how it operates well first. You're right. You're or right. you can find the right tools to, to curb what was going on. So the question I had was like, how do we make these people famous? How do we expose these people for- Well, you, well said. Well said. Yeah. The, the way yeah. we do it, the way we do it, is we, we have these conversations, Calvin. We have to have these conversations. We can't stop, right? Like, look, at the beginning of this meeting, we had 10 individuals who had nothing to do on a Friday night, but try to stir up trouble by trying to cancel this meeting because they did not want the knowledge to be shared. They did right. not want this exchange to happen. They didn't want to have this conversation to happen at all, right? So what we do is we expose bad behavior. We don't reward bad behavior. We expose it and we call it out. We put some light on it. We shine some light on it and we say, not in our neighborhood. And decisions are not going to be made with us. I mean, I mean, decisions are not going to be made for us without us, right? Like that is an integral component of community development, right? And, and one last thing. I want to challenge everyone to think about development in a different way. Why is development centered on the rich families, private families. Why, why do we have to go make friends and, and beg this rich private families to develop our communities? Why isn't there a public option for development? Why don't we hold development professionals to high regard, you know, make sure that they are embedded in, in, in the community development process. So when they build, they build with the community, community knowledge being actually 
informing these developments. I, I want to challenge people to think about that because, you know, we always think about how do we uh, put bandages on a broken system? We never think about changing it, right? And these are important conversations that we need to have as a city. Like, what? how have we benefited from it, right? And is, like, we need to think about why are we subsidizing such, uh, such harm, in my opinion? Why are we subsidizing such harm, right? So let's think about that. We've got Mark and then Marlene, and then we're going to do some announcements and we're ending our meeting today. Thank you so much, Mark. Going really quickly to Maggie's point, um, and what a lot of the conversation has been is learning what's coming up and getting engaged before the development happens. Uh, on our street, which is Dalhousie, which is Dalhousie Street, is more of a lane. It's only two and a half cars wide. Um, at Dow Magazine and everything out in front of us, all the all the old builds, uh, we kept asking for wider sidewalks because we don't have um, we don't have access. Like the sidewalks are only three four feet wide. So after a couple of times meeting with developers, we finally brought it up by saying we need sidewalks that are two wheelchairs wide and uh, and that changed the conversation and uh now on our street where the developers are street, you can hear the cement trucks outside of my window here the uh the developers have given us actually more than three feet each uh, they, they pulled their podiums back and given us extra street extra width we also didn't want our street to become a loading dock so they've actually changed their pedestrian facades to dalhousie street to give us some uh some pedestrian rather than trucks uh, on our street. So it, it took a lot, but it took it in the whole development planning stages and contacting the developers and the counselors as much as they may not be willing to talk uh, to, to bring it forward. What we hadn't anticipated on is Uber. <laughs> so now we're getting stuck with dozens and dozens of cars parked on the street every day, delivering food and delivering people to the ghost hotel and one of the condos. Um, so you still have to anticipate what the effect is going to be of your argument, but there are ways of getting the conversation and getting in there emotionally. And by emotionally, I don't mean like yelling and screaming, but finding that spot that's going to make them understand. Um, I'll, I'll be quiet now. That was very smart. That was really smart. Very, very smart. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for that conversation. I think that with, with the elections coming up, um, we have an opportunity uh getting together as a very very large group uh, to make a difference um and make this a, a a big political issue um and i, I and i think we need to take advantage of it this <clears throat> this nonsense <coughs> excuse me that that ford has brought in we really have to fight that i mean it isn't in yet Okay, and, and, and that's important. This is what he's proposing. Um, you know, we have to get in there and make, make sure it doesn't get in. And, and we can only do it through the election process uh, and let them know this is, this is not on. Um, and, and it's much better if we try to do that collectively. Um, and they've never seen that. They've never seen communities getting together yep. to try and fight these things. We have a rare opportunity if we come together as a coalition and, and fight these things. Because it's really outrageous what he's, what he's proposed, absolutely outrageous. Um, and and we, will, we will pay, if he pushes this through, uh, it will be so difficult to stop builders from doing almost anything if we don't stop him. And they already, the, the province is already have way, way too much influence on what goes on in the city. But this is, this is just off the rails. So I think it's important that we, we talk a lot and get us together as a, as a coalition and try and bring in some other neighborhoods to do the same, getting close to this, um, getting close to the elections. Well said, well said, Martin. Thank you so much. Well, and this, this was good, Waleed. You did good bringing us Thank together. You. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for so everyone who was I appreciate it. Uh, Maggie, you mentioned something in the chat that was super important. Do you want to just speak to that? Uh. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, 
I feel like it relates really well to what Marlene is talking about, um, like in terms of, you know, what the city used to be. <laughs> and for, you know, uh, many people who live here, what the city used to be 500 years ago is something that is really important, like you acknowledged in the opening for the meeting. Um, I've been looking at listening to trying to come up with like a personal strategy about how to, you know, do the right thing and reconcile myself with where I live and this politic. And I've been trying to pay attention to urban policy around development in relation to uh, UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declaration of Rights for Indigenous People since uh, Canada has adopted it as the framework for rec uh, reconciliation. Um, and the city has some stuff about that on their website. Um, and this podcast that I've put a link in the chat for is a conversation between, like within the policy community by an, um, indigenous uh, leaders about um, how that can affect development. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and for me, like a lot of what we're talking about, the ideas about big change and more participatory democracy, um, I feel like there's potential for that to come through the implementation of UNDRIP. Um, if people understand more about it and how it's been implemented in other places. Um, the other thing that I remembered that is a little bit different and I'll just say really briefly is that uh, when I think back to like the original intention, now I'm just talking about the Regent Park uh, project. When I think back to the original intention for that, um, it was really about like the neighborhood becoming reconnected to the parts of the city around it. Yes. And I feel like that's like a very strong argument against um, these like uh, types of built environments that create, um, you know, walls and barriers and sort of draw lines in the sand. Uh, yeah. So well, I well, feel like one of the things that I'm, yeah. you know, writing to my elected officials about is that uh, thing. And I just wanted to share that in case other people felt like yeah. that's a helpful way to, yeah. you know, uh, talk about <laughs> what the redevelopment is supposed to do for the city and the neighborhoods and, and the people who live, um, like I said, like very close together, but then there are these, you know, uh, strange boundaries. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just want to say thank you for mentioning that point. Um, and um, one of the reasons why we're doing that we did this event, we did this meeting is because people who are working together, well, like we're, we're working silos we need to work together we actually need to create spaces for neighborhoods associations for folks from various neighborhoods across the city to come together and talk about developments in an intentional way and i hope that folks found this meeting valuable um you know the information that was shared valuable i wanted you to share this information with your neighbors with your friends we're going to email folks this relevant information as well uh, so that you know they have something to read and review after so it's not just a meeting that they go to but they can share things and we're going to now talk about taking action but before i do that i want to acknowledge uh the contributions made by maggie thank you so much for reminding us about reconciliation because it comes back to that right at the end of the day how we build uh you know what we build um you know how is it connected uh to our past and our commitment uh you know to uh to reconciliation that process of reconciliation which involves all of us right, in different ways. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, folks who came from the Moss Park Community Benefits Coalition. Kais, thank you. I saw Andre earlier. Um, I want to thank also uh, of uh, friends uh, from the Regional Park Community Benefits Coalition. Larry, Miguel, thank you for joining. Calvin, thank you for joining. Michael, really appreciate you being part of this meeting. Uh, and I also want to uh, acknowledge folks from Healing Us One, Sarah, uh, one I'm hoping uh, is as part of uh, this meeting. Thank you for joining this meeting. Like it's important for us to take this knowledge and share it. And Mark, thank you so much for being part of this meeting as well. Um, and uh, 
Juliet, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Joanne. Uh, everyone involved, thank you. I'm gonna now just do three more slides, which is about take action and something important, which is focused on our space needs, uh, how we have challenged development for phases four and five uh, by making sure that community spaces are not built for us, but they that we actually are the ones that are informing how those buildings are built, okay? Uh, so I'm just gonna quickly share the screen. Uh, so take action. It's a very simple uh, slide. Change starts with you, my friends. Uh, you know, we are not going to be able to do any of this work if we keep this conversation to ourselves. We need to talk about how, um, you know, just recently at this meeting, you learned over 4,000 applications were been put for uh, to build housing. Only over 30, 30 something were uh, affordable housing. Those are very important takeaways, right? Uh, but also how development happens in our city and who mm -hmm. the players are, right? And we talked about some of those developers. Um, the other piece, quick announcement, there's a community uh, facility services report that's been developed. Uh, and there is an assessment that was done by the community building working group. Um, I helped uh, with that process, making sure that uh, we have the space needs of over 28 organizations in Regent Park that will inform uh, the planning for phases four and five. So please look forward to that report in your email, but it'll also be posted on regionparksocial.org. Um, and I just wanna thank, uh, you know, folks from Building Roots, the Moss Park Community Benefits Coalition, our guests tonight uh, from various organizations, and also the Neighborhood Association that I'm proud to serve on, the Regent Park Neighborhood Association, and my great team. I uh, saw so Zahid and a couple other folks earlier in the meeting. Uh, I hope we didn't remove anyone by accident throughout that process, but uh, I'm sure this uh, amazing conversation is going to be shared and broadcasted on YouTube for other folks to follow. So thank you. Uh, and please join our team. There's a link in the chat that we're gonna share we're also going to send this information by email. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that little bell notification. And don't forget to check us out on all our social medias. And if you want to see more, check our website.